If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Rachel Johnson and thanks for joining us on Common Ground. In tonight's episode, Clyde Lowe displays his impressive collection of pedal tractors in North Home. Community members cast a line in support of senior citizens at the Let's Go Fishing event on Lake Bemidji. And Robert Follis talks about his military experiences and showcases his collection of military uniforms and artifacts to students in Pillager. I started at about eight years old being interested in the military. I read everything on the Civil War that was possible to get a hold of. Uh, I got into arguments all the time with my social studies teacher because I would tell him things about the Civil War that he didn't even know about. And my military big background began actually in uh, ROTC in the uh, University of Missouri in, uh, Saint Louis, in uh, Columbia, Missouri. And, uh, I took two years of that. Then I went down to Mankato very shortly after that, and the guys at Mankato said, well, it's, we're infantry, come with us. So I spent nine years in the infantry at Mankato. Then I came to Long Prairie and joined an ordnance crew. Well, actually in between, I jumped to, uh, to the, engine, the combat engineer. So I actually ended up being in artillery, infantry, combat engineers, and uh, ordnance transportation and uh, administration. So all those different ones. It was in September of um, 66, I joined uh, the 52nd OC Company at Fort Benning, Georgia. I went out back to the University of Missouri and I worked as a police officer for, from 1970 to 77. And I worked for the railroad for two years and uh, in 79 I came up to Minnesota and been here ever since. And I continued with the history thing. I really did. I did all the history stuff for the units that I was attached to in the regular army, one of which was the uh, 31st Infantry, and they were the ones in the Philippines. Well, I think this is their, this is their heritage. Uh, this makes it something they can look at, understand, and, and it's an it's a interactive way to teach kids history. I did this program from 1988 until, uh, oh gee, 2004 when I got out. I was still doing programs for the Guard, very much similar to this. And uh, so then once I retired, I decided, well, it's fun, I'll do some more. So I've been doing it ever since. Thank All right, you, who wants to be what? Uh, who's pretty small? I don't Me, want a... Perfect. Yes, let's see if we can get you in the Korean uniform. Here you go. <laughs> let's fix you up as a tanker from uh, the, uh, from <laughs> okay. the, uh, the Cold War period. Okay. All right, that's your helmet. Just put the shirt on and button it up. You're done. Alrighty. Thank All right, you, we got you fixed. Thank you. But this guy, this guy had some importance because you see these? This indicates that he was somewhere in the 8th in the, uh, Army in the headquarters section because this he wouldn't have had if he hadn't been. So I'm thinking he was probably, and he spent quite a bit of time over there. That's about six months per time, so it's about 18 months he was over there. And uh, I'm thinking he was maybe a stenographer or somebody like that. Uh, who else we got here? You want to wear this one? All right, you could probably fit in that. You, you have become a, an Air Force DI. How about a modern? There goes the hat. That'll fit you. That'll fit you. 
Navy. You just enlisted in the Navy. All right. Uh, I can use another World War I guy. Let's see if this is going to fit you. Not bad. Put that on. Who else wants to be a Marine? You do, huh? I want that hat. You want this hat? Okay, there you go. Now, put this one. Put this one on. Just, just, you know, put it on and button it up. You just joined the six Marines. Would you like to be a be a, an Air Force fighter pilot? Okay. Well, I think you should be. Now, this is called a crusher. Okay. The way this works, you put it on your head, and then you put that earphones. Uh oh. Well, that's all right. It didn't hurt it too bad. You put the earphones on top of it, which causes it to come down and fold like that. Okay. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay, we'll see if we can't get you guys up here. Yeah, okay now, you two in behind her. Yeah, you come on there. Okay, good. Okay. Not bad for a bunch of people no pants, huh? <laughs> okay, what we have today is we're gonna do a little fashion show for you. And these are the various representations of there, at least the, the tunic and the blouse of the uniforms that have been worn by the soldiers from the First World War until the present day. As close as we can get it with what we have. This is the man that was in the trenches. This uniform came in in late uh, 1917 and we can tell because his insignia has changed. This is the Third Corps insignia. This is the first time that the Army ever adopted the distinctive insignia to a unit. And so this is the first one. This little red stripe tells us that this man was wounded in service. All of them with red stripes on that sleeve will, will be that. You'll notice that he has no rank, so he's a PFC, and he's wearing the good old tin, hot, tin hat which protected him in the trench. Come on up. This is our soldier from Minnesota. He belongs to the, 30, the 34th Division, the Red Bulls, the same as you see on these gentlemen right up here. He's got the combat gear on for the, uh, for the uh, sergeants. He has a pistol, he has a canteen, and his, this web gear can be adapted to put packs and things like that on it. His uh, blouse is a Eisenhower jacket, so that places him after 1943. The Red Bull fought in Italy, and it was some of the most difficult fighting in the world, and uh, they still have the honor of being uh, the longest in combat in World War II. Our latest people to join the Marine Corps, and she's wearing one of the blouses of the, of the Lady Marines. And it's especially, they have a, a uniform especially designed for them. You see that there is quite a bit of difference between the two uniforms. So this is a later Marine uniform. It's probably from possibly the 70s, 70s, 80s, something like that. But that's the Lady Marine uniform. So this uni uniform would be typically used in the Korean War by the Navy pilots that were flying off the carriers in support of the Marine Corps and the Army. This other young gentleman is wearing the, the typical onboard uh, work uniform, and most of the Navy ships have now adopted the baseball cap with such insignias, and we really certainly welcome them as veterans and, and, and as all the accolades they deserve. That basically is our, is our uh, fashion show, and I want to thank the young ladies and gentlemen here for assisting us, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. You're excused. Go back to your seats. Most of the job that I did for the museum was to identify the uniforms and equipment and what era it was and things like that, because it can be very confusing. So it was just one of those continual things. I've got a considerable library, and now that the computer's come along, it makes it easier to find, identify things. I had all this stuff. I might as well do something with it. I got it at flea markets and garage sales, and uh, my captain used to say, I think you could smell those things. I said, yep, I go buy them, and I see them from a mile away. <laughs> and so I picked them up. But uh, that's how I got into it, and it's, it's been fun, and I'm still doing it and I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Clyde Lowell, and uh, we're at the Cochin County Fair 2012 here, and uh, near Northland, Minnesota. And they've uh, I brought in my pedal tractor collection that I've collected on for about the last 20 years, and uh, we've displayed it. We displayed about half of it last year, and now this is the full display here this year. This Minneapolis Moline is a uh, custom UDLX. They made a hundred of them here. A guy did about 10 years ago. The real one is real highly collectible. They were uh, made so you could farm with them during the day and use them for a car at night to go to town. If They'd go about 40, 50 miles an hour down the highway. And then up here again, we've got some more of the Olivers. My favorite are the little ones that were made in the early 1950s. The little, they were made by the Esca company. You could see as the Olivers progressed, they started with the small Olivers and went up here. This is the later 1950s. Then you get into the early 1960s. These were made and uh, I've had them all restored by a gentleman in uh, Illinois. He was probably one of the best in the hobby at it, and, uh, but he quit now. He's 77 years old, and he's uh, gave it up, so I'm glad I got as many as I've got 30-some of them restored by him. His name was Tex Gadicke. This here particular Minneapolis Moline model was the only two-speed pedal tractor ever made. It was called a sh shuttle shift, and you could shift on the go, and it had two sprockets in it, a big one and a small one, and, and uh, it works great. And that's an original tractor that was bought, a guy bought for his daughter in the mid-1950s. She rode it for two years. Then they were uh, stored it up in the attic of their garage and they brought it back, uh, brought it down in 1998 at an auction sale, in, which I purchased over by Fargo, North Dakota. And this particular Oliver, the Purple Oliver, was made to commemorate in the late 50s, they made a real purple Oliver tractor, and that was uh, for plowing demonstrations in Nebraska. They did it to test to see what the uh, horsepower was and what they would pull for plows, and, and when it was all over, they were to be painted the Oliver green and released to the public, sold to the public. Well, some did get out in the Oliver purple, and so there are a few exist to this day, but very few. And then there also there's some that the green paint is chipped off after, uh, that people have got and they can see the purple under there and wonder, a lot of guys wondered what was that purple paint for, but that's the story behind that. Uh. And this particular John Deere is a newer model, I believe it came out last year, this 720. Most all my pedal tractors are die cast aluminum and this is getting away from the aluminum, I guess the price of it is what's driving it. And they're going back to the pressed steel and uh, which I'm not real happy with, but that's just the sign of the times uh, to save costs. So this rake is an actual working model. It was made by a fellow in Tennessee. As you can see, it's, they've got cables hooked up to it. It's an actual working model, which most of them are nowadays. They're guys that are, they're geniuses at building equipment are way above me, but they do build some nice stuff now. There's uh, This particular manure spreader was built by a machinist in Wisconsin, the only one he built. So there's, that's the only one of its kind. And it's all a working model. Pretty unique. They made a real John Deere lawnmowers in, uh, the mid-1960s, and they were called a patio set. And this was uh, spruce blue, patio red, sunset orange, and April yellow. And you could get different implements for them, uh, lawnmowers, rototillers, snowblowers, a blade, each one come with a different thing. And I think they were only made for the one year out of a John Deere 140, probably in 1965-66. But the pedal tractor, they only made the company, Ertl Company made this green one and I had the, my restorer in Illinois, he wanted to know if I wanted a patio set. So what he did is we bought these uh, green ones and we converted them in. We wrote to the John Deere company to get the exact paint. Restorer was very into detail, so he wanted it exactly, and they are, so that's the exact colors that the real John Deere's were painted. These were custom built too. They were, the real case had a black knight and then in 1976, to celebrate our 200th anniversary, they come out with a Spirit of 76 case. And, uh, and then the rest of these, these are from like in the 1950s. They've been all restored and, and uh, brought back to the, better than their original. The paint nowadays is so much better than when these were originally made, so they shine a lot better. And, okay, these two represent uh, an old tractor, but they were a new uh, production. They were made within the last 10 years, but they represent the old F-20 farm malls. And, and they're, as you can see, they're not near highly as detailed as the actual ones, pedals that were made back in the 1950s. But they're still a nice, represents a nice old tractor. And, and then we've got the, as we go on down the line here, we've got the Case Internationals. And uh, these are from the 1990s. 
And then these are in the 2000s, or these are actual pretty recent productions within the last two or three years, Case IHs. This pedal here is, represents uh, the five millionth tractor made by uh, International Harvester Harmall. And then uh, that STX 450 was a, uh, one of the first eight wheel pedals they made that's uh, duels all the way around. So, and it oscillates in the middle. This isn't big tractor country, this is more logging country, but this is, uh, there's a few local small farmers up in here. And, and it's, uh, we've kind of got a variety of pretty much every brand of pedal that was ever made, so. Hi, my name is Dan Posner. I'm with the Bemidji chapter of Let's Go Fishing. I've been a Bemidji resident since 1982. Uh, the Let's Go Fishing chapter, their mission is focusing on the seniors, getting them back onto the water. Most of the time they actually go out for a four hour trip and they go fishing. Sometimes they just want to go out in the evening and go for a boat ride. Uh, the program was designed and set up in 2002 from a founder down in Wilmer, Minnesota. Uh, his name is Joel Holmes. Uh, Bemidji started its chapter in uh, 2005. We take an average of about 800 seniors every season out onto the water in Bemidji. There's 28 chapters throughout the state of Minnesota and we've actually brought over 50,000 seniors back onto the water. And one of the things that, um, that we hear a lot when we're taking seniors back out onto the water is um, they're in the twilight of their life. Uh, they've gotten to a point where they have, maybe people thought they were, they were forgotten, but uh, Joe Holmes and the program is not designed. We are designed to remember these seniors, get them back out on the water. Some of the inspiration was just that, getting them back out on the water. One of the reasons the program was designed and set up is because as you get older, some of the things that are easy for us to do in our youth, launching a boat, uh, getting a boat onto the water, uh, running a boat, um, it's no longer able, seniors are no longer able to do that. Um, sometimes it might be financial, some might be you don't have anybody to go fishing with. I've fished my whole life. My boy and I just fished a tournament on Plantagenet. We caught a lot of fish, didn't do well, but it's a dream spending that time with your boat, with your boy on the water. I think the ability to be able to remove that from my life would be impossible. Some of these people fish their whole lives and all of a sudden these restraints uh, stop them from being able to do that. So that's why the program was developed, to get the seniors back onto the water. That's the inspiration, getting them back onto the water. Again, it's not even always about fishing. It's camaraderie, it's, so, it's a social event. It's getting them on the pontoon just to go for a pontoon ride. Fishing's a bonus, catching fish is a bonus. The program itself is 100% free for the seniors. We have a board uh, of about uh, nine members here in Bemidji. Our job is to go out into the community. We do some fundraising. We have a lot of local sponsors. If you just notice, we just had the Walleye Classic here in Bemidji, huge event. It's a huge part of our budget. They do a lot of good things for a lot of fishing programs in the area. If you take one trip out and you talk to these seniors and you visit with these seniors and you hear their stories and you hear their heartfelt thank yous, that's what you need. Uh, that's why I do it. Uh, and I'm selfish and when I get to be a senior, I want this program to be here so I can go fishing. You know, the people that think that they're sometimes forgotten, um, listening to their stories. When I go out for a ride on Bemidji, and some of the seniors used to say, you know, this used to be two lakes. The road used to run right across Bemidji. I remember this in the logging time. You know, I remember when this used to be here. Some of the stories when the seniors, it's a social event. They're visiting about how it used to be in the past. Listening to them and watching their smile when, uh, when they catch a fish, um, that's why I do it.
this is my first experience because I'm not a fisherman, but I think I'm going to enjoy it. After I married my second husband, he tried to make a fisherman of me, but I don't like the water that well. <laughs> Just getting outdoors, having the sunshine and having the goof around and pontoons are great. It's my greatest comfort is knowing that the pontoon would not tip over, <laughs> end up in the drink. <laughs> My name is Toddy Barsness, and I've been Let's Go Fishing for two years. This is going on the three years. Well, it's nice just to get out and fresh air and meet people, and it's fun to catch a fish. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful program for everyone involved. People volunteer to take us and it's great we enjoy it and other people certainly would enjoy getting out when they're not able to otherwise it's a great program it's you know the scenery and it's so relaxing and if you're lucky you get a bonus and catch fish <laughs> but it's it's lovely to be out here you know these people are great to do what they do, you know. All right, I'm Jen. I'm a CNA at Gold Pine Home. This is actually my first Let's Go Fishing trip, and I'm just here to help everybody out with whatever they need. Um, it's really easy to get everybody involved in Let's Go Fishing. Actually, at Gold Pine, I used to work in activities, so I've seen it from another point of view, and we go around and we offer it to pretty much every single resident that lives with us. So everybody gets an opportunity to come on the boat. Um, a lot of the people that we have come on here, they don't get the opportunity to go fishing unless it's with family and even then it's, you never know. So it kind of brings them back to when they were totally healthy and able to do things on their own. And sunshine is good for everybody. So it's really fun to see them having fun and to see the smiles on their faces makes me happy. So that's nice. Um, Let's Go Fishing is a really great opportunity for the elderly people that want to get out and about. Um, there's plenty of help on the boat. So if you don't like to bait a hook like me, there are other people who will do it for you. And if you get lucky and catch a fish, there are people to take it off. It's just a really great opportunity for anybody who wants to get out. Well, last year I was always working when everybody came back and I can't remember a time that people weren't laughing and joking about what happened and telling lies and stories about the big fish they caught. And It's just really fun to see everybody just have a great time and it really does lift their spirits, so that's good. Um, being a CNA, we're running so much, not able to spend as much time as I would like with each individual person um, so today has actually been a really great opportunity for me to sit and visit with each person and have a little bit of fun so that's nice I'm Elsie Norberg and right now I'm on a pontoon boat fishing with a nice group of people I've, I've lived at Copeland for a little over a year now and and heard about them going on the fishing trips and watched them get ready to go. And it sounded like it would be very interesting. They all enjoyed it. When I was younger, I used to do a lot of fishing, a lot of ice fishing. I was just looking forward to the, the, good, the good pontoon boat ride. I've been out on a smaller one, but um, I feel safe on a pontoon. It's, it's, it's nice. It's nice to see that everybody's enjoying it and, and even if the fish aren't biting, we're trying, waiting for the big one. I, th I think this trip would be recommended for any seniors. It's a good experience for everybody. It's available to all seniors, all seniors 55 and older. Uh, it's available for one call to get a group together, whether you're a church organization or whether you're just a bunch of friends. 
Uh, I want you to know, I want you to be able to go out and go fishing. I want you to be able to pick up that phone, talk to Janae, and schedule a group and schedule an outing. You, outing. you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about the, uh, the cost. You don't have to worry about the bait. You don't have to worry about the guide. Everything's taken care of. This program is designed to use it. Uh, no guilt. Please use that phone number. Please get it back out onto the water. Take advantage of the program. That's what all these volunteers are here for. Thanks for joining us on Common Ground. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next week. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.